My name is Joe Callahan. I was born and brought up in Newburyport. I uh, lived uh, at, on Greenlee Street, number four Greenlee Street. Graduated from Newburyport High School in 1952. <clears throat> and uh, I was on the fire department at Newburyport for many, many years. And then I uh, went, moved over to Salisbury in 1972. And I was fire chief in Salisbury for uh, 17 years before I retired. And uh, I spent a lot of time doing history of uh, researching history of the greater Newburyport area now. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that history today. Okay, I grew up, like I said, on Greenlee Street. This is the back bay section of Newburyport. A lot of changes have occurred uh, since I was uh, a kid growing up over here. I lived next door to. Uh, <clears throat> What well, was a very busy freight depot down there then, now it's of course the uh, home of the CVS drugstore. But back in those days, the freight train would come in every day and leave, car, leave uh, several freight cars of freight. Uh, there was a big freight house down there, they would unload the cars, some of the freight would go into the freight house and different uh, industries and businesses in Newburyport would come and pick up the freight. And a lot of the freight was unloaded by businesses in the car, uh, right from the cars into their trucks, right from the freight cars into the trucks. I can remember some of the lumber companies uh, unloading lumber down there. I can remember coal coming in. Uh, Cashman's, I believe, had some coal delivered there a number of times. Atkinson did also. Um, there was animals delivered there. Sweeney's pig farm used to have pigs come there two or three times a year. Uh, there was chickens were delivered for some of the farmers. They'd come in small crates in the freight cars. The farmers would come and pick them up. Uh, horses, pony, uh, young, young horses were delivered there many times. There was a pen down there that they would put the animals in when they unloaded them from the freight cars. Automobiles and small pickup trucks and like that. They were all delivered by <coughs> freight train in those days. Uh, not like the car carriers that they have today. The cars, the freight cars were specially uh, designed to, uh, and they had apparatus in them so that the cars could be hoisted up and they'd be like one on top of another. I can remember all of that very vividly and used to watch them as kids. We'd watch them unload all of that stuff years ago. It was a, the freight yard was a very active place in those days. The freight train, uh, the freight business went downhill the uh, B&M closed up the freight depot in 1954. In the summer of 1954 is when the last trains were in and out of the pawn, what they called the Pawn Street Depot. Uh, First National bought the property and they built the present building that's down there now, which is occupied by CVS Drugstore. Uh, First National built that building and they opened it in October of 1956. First National stayed there till about 1980, and then they moved out. They were the competition was closing in on them from the newly found supermarkets uh, uh, and uh, malls that were opening up on Story Avenue. And the IGA store went and moved into the uh, First National property for a, a short time, but they didn't make it either. And then after that, the uh, CVS drugstore moved in there and they've done very, very well over the last decades. They're still there now, of course. We read comic books. My father worked at Fowles. Uh, we used to get free comic books. Uh, he'd bring them home, they'd be a, probably a week or so out of date. And a new report news. Uh, we always, the family always subscribed to the Boston Post in those days, a morning newspaper. It used to be delivered to the house and the New Report News. And Kennedy was a very popular man, not only in this area, but everywhere. I can remember several times him being in New Report. He was in a couple of parades. Uh, I can remember him marching up Pleasant Street in a parade that I saw him at one time. He was with some of the local uh, politicians at the time. And uh, he was here several times. Uh, former Mayor Dick Sullivan was a very personal friend of uh, President Kennedy's. Uh, I knew Dick well myself. Uh, everybody in New Report knew Dick Sullivan. And uh, I can remember when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated, <clears throat> uh, Jack Cutter 
who was a former fire chief in the report, he and I were doing some work for Dick Sullivan at the time up on his house on Congress Street. Dick Sullivan's wife opened the door, Jack and I were working out in the yard, and uh, she opened the door and she said, uh, there's some tragic news coming on television. And uh, she said, uh, President Kennedy has been shot down in Texas. So as I remember, we went in the house and looked at the television for a few minutes and they were showing pictures of what was going on down in Texas. And then, of course, it wasn't very long when the word came was passed over the television that the president had passed away because of the of the, the, uh, his injuries as a result of the shooting. And uh, I can remember that. And of course, that was a, there was a several days of mourning uh, for the president uh, following that. Uh, I can remember them very vividly. All the flags were half-staffed. Uh, some of the stores were closed. And it was a very sad, sad uh, moment in time, period in time. OK, back in World War II, Another tragic uh, period of our time, of course, uh, I was only uh, seven years old, I guess, when Pearl Harbor happened, and uh, I can remember that. I had never heard of Pearl Harbor, of course, before that day. A lot of other people hadn't either, and uh, I can remember that, and I can remember uh, <clears throat> several of the kids and uh, uh, fellows that were a lot older than I at the time just in our own Back Bay neighborhood here, the Harrises and uh, Kenny Brooks over on, lived over on Greenleaf Street, a little bit from further from me, and uh, several of the other uh, families that lived around the neighborhood, one by one, the boys would be disappearing, going into the service. The McFarlands uh, on, uh, lived over on Pawn Street, a big family, there several of their boys went in the service, and uh, several of the women in the area too, uh, served, of course, in World War I. Um, I was very young at the time, and I can remember uh, when newspapers would be full of tragic stories every day and, and uh, about the war. And, uh, of course, I was in elementary school, grade school, most of the, that time, from the first to the fifth grade. I was in the fifth grade when the, when the uh, World War II ended. <coughs> I can remember the... Uh, all the boys coming home, men and women coming home from World War II. And uh, the city had a big celebration. They had a huge parade to welcome the boys back. And uh, they had a banquet at City Hall. Of course, I didn't go to any of those out for that or anything. I do remember the parade. They had a huge parade through the downtown streets and a big fireworks display at the Mall, like I, like I mentioned before. And uh, it was a tragic time of our uh, tragic period of our times. Well, <clears throat> I can remember, you know, all the things that we took part in as kids, uh, playing ball over on the mall, ice skating on the mall, going swimming down a Plum Island in the summertime. Uh, we used to thumb a ride down a Plum Island, uh, things like that. I've always been a sports fan. Uh, <clears throat> Paul Doyle and I used to thumb our way into Boston when we were kids and, and uh, when we could manage to put a few bucks together to go in and see the Red Sox play in the summertime. We used to do that two or three times every summer back in the, back in the 50s. Uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, we never seemed to have trouble getting a ride in or a ride out. We used to take the subway. Uh, we used to thumb and get a ride into Everett in that area or the Revere area and then take the subway into Boston and take the subway out after the game and thumb a ride home. And uh, we always had luck getting rides, uh, thumbing, thumbing rides. A lot of, all the kids thumbed in those days. Not, <coughs> wasn't as dangerous in this as, as it might be today. We lived in a, I, I feel that I've lived in a generation uh, where there's been a lot of changes, a lot of uh, changes. I, I'm not sure that all of them are good, but. Uh, there's been a lot of progress made in industry and uh, medicine, things like that, things along those lines. I don't know, I like history. I've always liked history. It's probably the only subject in, in school that I, that I really enjoyed. I wasn't a big uh, fan of going to school, but uh, I've always been interested in history, and uh, particularly history in the local area. Uh, I just uh, 
got involved and uh, my family was always interested in history. My mother and father always used to talk about things that happened when they were kids. Uh, uh, things changed in their generation just like they have in my generation. And um, I just got hooked on it and uh, I was uh, spent a lot of time years ago, and I still do today, down at the library research and history. I've been through all the old newspapers down there, and uh, I'm same way down at the Historical Society, and uh, I've, I've been working on a project down there identifying photographs lately, and uh, I, just, uh, I just have always enjoyed history, and I, I like doing research on history of not just no report but the entire local area. I hope that uh, there are several people in, in the new report area now and I'm sure this is true th throughout the region. There are several people that are interested in uh, like I am in history and there's a lot of people doing research in new report. Um, I unfortunately I, I don't see too many of the real younger people coming along doing it. Probably when they get a little older I'm hoping that uh, uh, some of these younger people and a lot of smart kids around I hope that when they get a little older that they will take uh, more of an interest in the history and uh, take advantage of some of the uh, things that they have locally. There's an awful lot of history uh, available at the Historical Society and at the archive, archival unit down at the New Report Public Library. I don't see many, many younger people, not, I don't mean little kids, but younger adults that are all that interested in history now, but my hope is that over the next coming years as they grow older that they will take more of an interest in it and carry on for those of us that are carrying it on now. We're standing out here just off of Greenlee Street, right uh, the house behind me is the house I grew up in back in the late 30s and the 40s and the 50s and uh, this neighborhood has changed quite a bit since I was a kid growing up. Uh, we're at the site of the rear of the uh, CVS drugstore now. Years ago when I was growing up back in the 40s in the 50s, this was a very busy place, but it had a different occupancy out here. The B&M Freight Station was here for many, many years. And uh, here on Greenlee Street, there was five sets of tracks that crossed the street going into the yard. Uh, it was a busy place. The trains came in. The track tra uh, engines came in every, just about every morning and uh, left freight cars. Right over here on the right, there was a huge building. It used to be the uh, Glen Mill Cereal Company and over further to the left was the big freight house over about where the child, where the kids are playing over there on the play yard now. That was a long big wooden building, the freight house. And uh, in the middle of that, probably about where the end of the uh, CVS drugstore is now, there was a platform there. Uh, when I was a kid, it wasn't unusual to see freight cars come in uh, with uh, automobiles and trucks. They didn't come over the road like they do today so much. Call a Chevrolet and the Ford Company and all the automobile agencies in Newburyport. Their deliveries, most of them used to come right here off of the, the uh, Pond Street Depot. There was a platform there. The uh, cars were specially rigged to handle automobiles and small trucks. And uh, they, when the freight came in, the company would come and unload them. I can see some of them. I can remember them heading up Greenlee Street here now, going out to Collis's to the Chevrolet place. There also used to be uh, a lot of animals delivered over here. When I was a kid, it wasn't unusual also to see horses delivered. Uh, I can Many, many times there was uh, chickens delivered. Some of the farmers would have chickens come uh, in crates on the freight trains and then they would come and pick them up. Uh, it was Sweeney's pig farm out on, used to be out on Hale Street in the report. Uh, two or three times a year they used to have small piglets delivered. There was a pen over there off to the uh, back of the, where the building is now. There was a fenced-in pen there right alongside of one of the tracks 
and uh, they would take the pigs all, let the pigs run off the train and into the pens, and then Mr. Sweeney and his helpers would come before the day was out and uh, put the pigs in the truck and uh, haul them out to uh, his farm out on Hale Street. Uh, another thing that used to be delivered up here, and uh, all of the neighbors didn't look forward to when the cars were coming in, but the uh, probably two or three times a month there would be a freight car or a couple of freight cars delivered and they would have the untreated hides that used to go down to the tannery which operated for many years down on Federal Street. And uh, believe me, the smell was unbelievable. You could smell it all over the neighborhood and uh, the guys that worked at the tannery would come out with a truck, dump truck, and they would unload those hides by hand into the truck and haul them away. And the whole neighborhood was certainly very, very happy when the uh, when that job was done and the, and the uh, trucks would leave and of course after the trucks left the truck the uh, car would still smell and uh, everybody was happy when the engine came the next day and took the cars out of here. It was a busy place the freight house uh, when I was a kid growing up there was a man by the name of Ingalls he lived up the north end somewhere so he was a nice man uh, the kids, we used to play around the freight cars and stuff all the time, and uh, he didn't bother us too much. Uh, he was a good guy, and it was, it was a very busy place in those days. And uh, I can remember it well and enjoyed growing up out in the neighborhood. This little plot over here where the flagpole is, uh, that was dedicated in November on uh, Veterans Day. It was Armistice Day in those days, in 1942. That little plaque was dedicated. There's a monument, a small monument there, and they put the flagpole up. That was dedicated to all the men and women from the Back Bay area who were serving in their country in World War II. The flagpole was put out. I can remember the day it happened. There was a gathering out here, a good-sized gathering, probably a couple of hundred people out on the street, and uh, all the politicians are out here. And uh, I suppose probably the high school band was here, and uh, they dedicated that flagpole and that little that little plot of land there. The B and M Railroad was uh, very good uh, to the town, and uh, they let the town acquire that, uh, or they just uh, let them acquire that piece of land for that purpose. And uh, it's been there ever since. Uh, the town, the city takes care of the grass every year, they cut it, uh, and uh, they kept, the place is kept up well. There used to be an honor roll there with all the men and women's name on it, but that deteriorated through the years and uh, it was, it's been removed quite a few years ago now. Also when I was growing up, uh, in the late 30s, and I can remember it, and in the early 40s, over here across the street on the corner of Fulton Street, where the condominiums are now, uh, Bossy Gillis had a gas station there and a garage. It was right where these, right on, right on the corner. He had a couple of gas pumps out front there. That was a busy place. Uh, <clears throat> that was before he moved his gas station down to Market Square. Then there was an old shoe shop that was just beyond those buildings. Uh, that was a, a busy place years ago, as, but as, I, as a shoe shop, but as I remembered, it was a uh, used for kind of like where they had these recycling centers today. They picked up cardboard and, and uh, newspapers and stuff like that and shipped them, bundled them up and shipped them out. That place uh, was destroyed uh, by fire in 1950. Getting back to the Freight Depot, they closed up uh, the last trains that came in and out of here were in the summer of 1954. And the uh, First National Company bought the property off the B&M at that time. They built the building that's here today. Uh, it's been altered a little bit. Uh, but they built the, what is the main building here, they built that and it was opened as a supermarket in 1956. I think it was on, in October when they opened it in 1956. They stayed here, First National stayed here at this location until 1980 and then uh, 
because of the competition from the stores at Story Avenue opening up, uh, they closed down. There was an IGA store tried to make it here for a while, but they didn't last long. And then shortly after that, uh, the uh, CVS drugstore took over and built the place. And uh, they've done a very nice business uh, ever since. And they still do, of course. Also, when I was a kid, this property over here, the big three-story house there on the small barn, that all belonged, that's on Central Place. It comes in from State Street, the access is from State Street. When I was a kid, Dr. Blakely had his business there. He was a very well-known veterinarian. And did a, he was a very busy veterinarian, probably one of the only ones in town at that time. And uh, that barn, he used that to treat uh, dogs, and that place was all fenced in as it is today. And uh, the yard was full of dogs and uh, things like that years ago. Uh, it, was a, it was a busy place. Occasionally, he'd have some other animals there. Uh, but for the most part, he uh, treated dogs in those days. He was a very nice man, and he did a very good business over there. Now, the house on the left here, number four and number two Greenlee Street, uh, my parents owned that house in those days. Uh, we lived at number four. Uh, the house next door here was number two Greenlee Street, this yellow house. When I was a kid, the Harris family lived here. Uh, they were a very nice family. This house, the original house, it's since been added onto in the rear. The original house out front here was moved here back in the 1880s. Friend, it used to sit on, pawn, on the Bartlett Mall facing out to Pond Street, diagonally across the street from uh, where the CVS drugstore is now. That house sat on the Mall and it was, it was moved over here. And uh, <coughs> back in the 80s, uh, that addition that we can see in the back was put on the house. Up on the corner of Greenlee Street here, the big house which you can barely see was Miss, the first house in Newburyport that had ex exterior Christmas decorations. It was well known all over. People used to come from miles around to see it in the winter time. It was owned by Robert McKinney. He was uh, a well known undertaker in Newburyport at that time. And uh, I can just barely remember when I was a kid, uh, the street would be packed with cars and uh, at Christmas time, he had all these bushes and the trees and the house all decorated with exterior uh, lights. It was a beautiful, beautiful uh, sight. Now, of course, there's many houses around Newburyport now and other communities that do the same thing. But he was the original one here in Newburyport. That house was the first house that had extensive exterior Christmas decorations. Across the street where the fire station is, when I was a kid growing up, that was just an empty field. A man by the name of Randall owned the apartment house here on the corner, and he owned all of that land. That was just an open field where the station is now, adjacent to the railroad tracks, of course. We used to play over there when we were kids quite some time ago. Bartlett Mall here on the left, was a much more active place when I was a kid than it is today. Uh, we skated over there in the winter time, like kids do today. We also played ball on the over on the Pond Street side. That doesn't that activity doesn't happen today like it used to years ago. It was a much more busy place. People used to come up here and walk. They didn't have the boardwalk or anything downtown, of course. I crossed across the mall there thousands of times when I was a kid, growing up, going to school and walking downtown, going to, to uh, activities that we had playing over there and stuff like that. Getting downtown here now to the post office, Mission Oak Grill, it was a Baptist church for many, many years. Down here on the <clears throat> down here on the right, the big red brick building that was across from the police station. That was the Strand Theater when I was growing up. That was a busy place. Also, we used to go there every Saturday. You could get in for ten or eleven cents and see a couple of movies. And, Looney Tunes and advertisements and things like that. All this parking down the waterfront here 
There was none of that years ago. Leon and Teddy's had a gas station right here on the left-hand side where the open space is now. The Chetsis had an appliance shop here and a business here, Chetsis Appliance. Right here next to the fire station where I worked for many years, uh, there was a gas station right here in the empty lot where the, fire, where the flagpole is now. And of course the fire department was there and the headquarters station until uh, right around 1980 or 81 when they moved out to uh, Greenleaf Street where they are now in a much more modern building. The bullnose was not here in, back in the 50s on Market Square. That was all put in in the later years when the urban renewal took over downtown. Foul soda shop sign is still there. Soda and cigars, it's no longer, no longer that type of a store. It's just a plain restaurant now. But uh, that sign is one of the oldest, uh, if not the oldest, neon sign still uh, in Newburyport. State Street had a lot of small businesses in those days like it did, to, like it does today. There weren't any, nowhere near as many restaurants in those days as there are today. Here on the corner where the book rack is was Eaton's Drug Store. I worked there when I was in high school for two or three years. And a uh, man by the name of Eggleston owned the drug store. This was a busy place. J.J. Newbridge was across the uh, uh, getting mixed up here. Kresge's was here where the Richdale is. And J.J. Newbridge was up here uh, on the left-hand side where the Marco Polo place is today. Kennedy's Butter Store was on the corner here where the Oregano, Oregano Pizza place is today. In Street, when I was a kid and when I worked uh, downtown, you could drive right down In Street. Traffic it was one way. Traffic would go uh, down In Street. It was one way from Pleasant Street. There were parking meters along the street. There were many buildings that are gone uh, today. Brock's Fish Back, it was just around the corner here. Hoyt's Drug Store was right on the corner, where we're over here on the right. A busy place. The downtown was busy. Lincoln's Department Store, Clothing Store, Men's and Women's Clothing were here on the right. Lutton Kelly, who was presently out on the hardware store, presently out at the traffic circle, corner of Parker Street, they were located in here where the bakery is now. Over on the left, where the pretty poppy is, when I was a kid, the uh, Daly's Bakery was in there. Uh, they were a busy eating place, one of, the, one of the few eating places downtown in those days. Not like it is today, there's an eating place all, all over the downtown today. Rick Baco's running store, he's a friend of mine, he's been uh, in business there for many, many years. And of course, when I was a kid, the post office was, was uh, right, still right here where it is right now. Paul Murphy newspaper and soda shop was right in here where the gallery is. That was a busy place, that was a gathering place for all the local politicians. A lot of uh, political decisions were made in Val Murphy's little business in those days. The councillors and the mayor were always in there. There was probably as, almost as many decisions made over the years as there was here in City Hall. Uh, those were, but the ones made in Bows were unofficial and then they would officially, they officially pass them over in here. Going up Pleasant Street here on the right hand side. It used to be the Port Theater across on the upper corner here. That was the Port Theater. That was a busy place in those days. I can remember when that was built and when they had the grand opening there. A man by the name of O'Laughlin was the man, the first manager there. He lived up on Buck Street. He was a nice man. The Port Theater was a busy theater. Kind of put the strand in the Premier Theatre's out of business. The port ran, ran a lot longer than the Strand and the Premier Theatre's did. Now that I guess that's probably going to be where the 
parking garage or the hotel is going to be that they're talking about. Through shoe company here on the left and this big red brick building, that was a busy place. A lot of people worked in there. A lot of people worked in there in the shoe business. I also, when I was young, I worked up here before I went out of the fire department, I worked at Peavy's Hardware Store. Peavy's Hardware was over here on the right. Orange Leaf is there today. Martin Dugan had a hardware store and a plumbing business across the street over here. Up on the right hand side of State Street, D. Cashman Hardware was in business. Uh, so there were three or four hardware stores right in the downtown area today. Now uh, there are none. Hunt, Hunt and Kelly's moved out to the traffic circle. Kelly, uh, Cashman's is right in there where the European fashion shop is today. Up here on the right hand side on State Street where the Port Tavern is that's where the A&P was located. They were located in there for many, many years before they moved out to their, uh, out to the traffic circle where the uh, district courthouse is today. They moved out there approximately the same time that the First National moved from right here where the Institution for Savings is now. Uh, they both moved one to Pond Street and one to the traffic circle at about the same time in the early to middle 50s. The Wolf Tavern Hotel was right here on the corner where, this, where the parking lot is now. Unfortunately, that was a, a beautiful building that was torn down in sometime in the uh, early to middle 50s. Uh, that was a big loss for Newburyport, I think. The yellow house up here on the corner, corner high in state. The American Legion home was in there for many, many years. And across in this other yellow house on the upper corner of state at High Street was the uh, home of the Knights of Columbus. They were there for many, many years. Uh, and then it's turned into condos now. As long as I can remember, there's always been a gas station here at the corner high in state. Uh, the Weber brothers ran the station there for 30 or 40 years. They ran that station, did a nice business there. Uh, they were well-known boys and they uh, had a good business in that area, in that corner. Hood Milk used to have a distribution plant right here on the left. The new report manor sat on this building over here on the left hand side. It's Kelly's rental place now. New report manor was a, a very well, very busy uh, restaurant back in those days. Lunton Kelly's here now. That's where Carla Chevrolet was years ago. Arthur Fuller had a donut shop there at the, where the Enterprise car rental is. There was a golf station for years and years where the courtyard roast beef is. And this entire traffic circle area was, that used to be a Tidal station there now. All these places were gas, were gas stations years ago when I can remember. These buildings over here where the subway is and the Dunkin' Donuts, they were all new, but there was two or three gas stations right along that area when I was a kid. Like I say, Fuller had a donut shop there. The A and P used to be over here on the left-hand side where the uh, the courthouse is today. They moved out there, and that uh, building stood there until they built the courthouse. They ripped it down when they built the courthouse a uh, number of years ago. Now, another old-time New Report business is right up here on the left. <clears throat> so now it's the Port Sheet Metal. When I was a kid growing up, it was a Johnson oven factory. Uh, now that uh, they did pretty much the same thing when I was a kid, they were in the oven business and a lot of uh, tin work was done in there, metal work. 
Joe Keefe grew up in that house. He was a friend of mine. He was the uh, superintendent of streets in the report for many, many years. These brick houses were just single families lived there when I was a kid growing up. Now they're all apartments, both of them. Let me take you up through Dalton Street here. Okay. Going up Dalton Street here, this big gray house on the left used to sit at the corner of High and State where the gas station is now. That was uh, moved up here back in the 1920s sometime. Bossy Gillis, uh, who was the mayor of Newburyport, ran the gas station back there. He lived in that house. This house here, number 11, number 13 Dalton Street, was moved here from over on Summer Street uh, back in 1934-35 when they built the highway. Uh, the Route 1 bypass went through Newburyport. They moved a lot of houses in those days and that house was one of them. <coughs> Old Hill Cemetery off to the left. The report's first mayor, Caleb Cushing, is buried right up there by those trees. This yellow house over here, when I was growing up, a man by the name of Houghton, Mr. Houghton, he was a city treasurer of the report for over 40 years. This house right here was moved here in 1906 from Vernon Street when they uh, widened uh, the railroad, when they took out the railroad tunnel over on Vernon Street. My mother was born and brought up in that house when it was on Vernon Street, and she can remember when they moved it over here. Fulton Street gravel pit off to the left here. That, used, that was a ball field when I was a kid. We used to play down there all the time. Back in the WPA days, the city had a uh, a uh, curbstone making plant down there. They produced uh, concrete curbstones. Many of them are still in use around Newburyport today. This big house uh, over here on the right, my mother, after they moved from Vernon Street, her family moved, lived in that house there. The condos in back were added years later. Um, there used to be a big barn out in the back there. I can remember that when I was a kid. This here is the back entrance driveway to the back part of the uh, Highland Cemetery. There aren't too many people buried in there anymore. The cemetery is pretty well filled up. Occasionally there's a, bur a burial there, but not like it used to be when I was a kid. There were burials there all the time. Well, let's see, down here on the right, these houses were built by the Cubic family. They're a well-known family in the report. Both of these houses they built. Uh, <coughs> their father had gardens. Across the street, across Route 1 over here where the, where the uh, Haley's ice cream stand is now, that uh, the Cubics had their gardens over there. They used to specialize in gladiolias. He grew beautiful, beautiful gladiolias. Also had a lot of vegetables. The Cubic boys used to come around the neighborhood with a push cart in the summertime uh, selling vegetables and flowers and stuff like that. Freddie Cubic, uh, one of the boys, he, him, he built the uh, building over there that's uh, uh, the ice cream stand now and he ran a Freddie ran an ice cream stand there himself for many, many years. And then he later owned the mess, the uh, Mel Spa. For, unfortunately, Freddie died at a young age. He was a smart businessman. All the industrial park off here to the left, that was all open land when I was a kid. Uh, Low Street was a dirt road, Common Pasture Road, which is now Graff Road. That was a dirt road in those days. Where all these industrial buildings are, that was, uh, that was all uh, open fields in those days. A ride down Cottage Court. 
right here. This is an area that's undergoing, presently undergoing big changes. Uh, going to be houses built down here. This property was all owned by Tom Ronan when I was a kid. Joe Keefe and I used to come down here a lot, play and hang around. Joe's father and Tom Ronan uh, were great friends. World War I buddies. The old barn over here is pretty well dilapidated, if you can if you can see much of it now. I'll get in there. There's the barn, what there is left of it. Tom had, uh, when, when we were kids, Tom probably had uh, a dozen cows that he used to keep in there. That barn was moved when they put Route 1 in back in the 30s, like the buildings that I showed you on Dalton Street that were moved. This barn was moved from where Route 1 is out there now. Pretty well in tough condition there now. I guess they're going to try to save some of it, but I don't know how they're going to make out. Tom used to put his cows out to pasture every day. Put them out on the other side of the highway, out where the, he owned land, out where the industrial park is now. He would take his herd of cows up Cottage Court here, and he would cross Route 1. There was no traffic lights on Route 1 in those days, and there also was no Route 95 in those days. So there was heavy traffic on Route 1 out here, a lot of truck traffic, car traffic. Well, when I was a kid, uh, Frog Pond down here is like it is today, it's all frozen over. There's a lot of people used to come skating there in the winter time. This was uh, years ago, when back in the 50s, back in the 40s and the 50s, Bartlett Mall was the uh, scene uh, that they used to use every year for fireworks displays at 4th of July or any other celebrations that warranted having fireworks. They used to shoot them off. Uh, we were on Greenlee Street, right down over the double bankings here, right along in the edge of the pond. They used to set up the uh, uh, fireworks down there and fire them, fire them off. Uh, the big crowds would be gathering over there on the Pond Street side, uh, watching the fireworks. And uh, of course, they wouldn't allow that today. The crowd has to be a greater distance back than what was allowed in those days. But, uh, anyway, uh, one of the biggest uh, fireworks displays back in those days was held at the end of celebration uh, after the end of World War II. And uh, they had a huge display here. There was hundreds and hundreds of people gathered on the mall and on High Street and all of the, the whole area to watch that display. I can remember that display very, very well when I was a kid. It was quite a, quite a huge display, but that's where all the fireworks used to be. Of course, now they shoot them off from down, uh, down at Cashman Park. But they shot them off here for many years.